Hi everyone, welcome to my show, Games You Haven't Played, where we discuss the games that aren't household names. I'm your host, Colin Pierce, and before we get started with our first episode, I just want to make a few things clear. First off, this show is not meant to be competition with other similar shows like Angry Video Game Nerd or 16-Bit Gems. And while I will be covering or at least referencing some of the same games as they have, this is no comment on their work. They're doing a great job. James Rolfe is, of course, a god among internet game reviewers, and this show is greatly influenced by his work, as are all shows done in this format. Second, I will be reviewing both good games and bad games. The only real criteria for selection in this show is that a game must not be too well known. Third, while this show is meant to be more informative than most, I will try to include some humor here and there to liven things up. So, with all that out of the way, let's dive into our first episode. Let's get this show off to the right start by looking at an unknown game for an unknown system. But first, a little backstory. In 1986, Nintendo released the first game in the Legend of Zelda series, a game that would define the action RPG genre. While there were a few examples of this genre before Zelda, like Falcom's Dragon Slayer and Xanadu, and D and Esau's Hide Live, Zelda refined and polished the genre to a point that many previous games in the genre were rendered obsolete. Designed by Shigeru Miyamoto, who is also the creator of Mario, this game really broke a lot of rules when it first came out. There was no rigid set of linear levels that you had to complete in order. Being an early example of an open world game, along with the original Metroid, players were basically on their own in a way never before seen in console games. There were some games that did similar things on home computers where memory was not as much of an issue, but this was pretty much almost unheard of in console games at the time. In fact, when the game was released in America the following year, Nintendo's American branch worried that kids might not get it, so the game came with not only a manual, which was more elaborate and detailed than usual, but a map of most of the overworld and the first few dungeons. I don't know whether to be thankful to Nintendo for going the extra mile, or to be insulted that they would treat us as if we were stupid. Of course, when Zelda was the huge hit that it was, competitors were quick to offer up their own take on the genre, and created some cult classics all their own. Games such as SNK's Chrysalis, or Compile's Guardian Legend, games which I'm sure I'll end up covering at some point in the future. But here's the thing. Compile actually didn't create just one Zelda clone. They actually made two. But here's the thing. The Guardian Legend was released on the NES, which was the big dog at the time, so it's somewhat known. Compile's other Zelda clone was only released in the US on Sega's Master System, which was running in a very distant second place. The Master System, known in Japan as the Mark III, was Sega's attempt to directly compete with the NES. And needless to say, that didn't go very well, at least in the United States, until a few years later when they released their follow-up console, the Mega Drive, known in the States as the Genesis. But that's a story for another day. Compile was a Japanese third-party game developer that mostly made shooters, including games such as Xanak, Aleste, Gunhead, which was known in America as Blazing Lasers, with too many Z's. Gunnack, which is one of the weirdest shoot 'em ups I've ever played in my life. And many others. Seriously? A lucky cat boss? Oh, Gunnack, you so silly. They also created the beloved Tetris clone, Puyo Puyo, as well as the already mentioned Guardian Legend which was actually a spin-off of a compile shooter called Gardic, which is evident in the game's Japanese title, Gardic Gaiden. In Japanese, Gaiden means side story. 
With all that backstory out of the way, we can finally focus on the subject of today's episode. Compiled's lesser-known Zelda clone, Golvelius. Golvelius, released in 1988 for the Sega Master System, tells the story of a young warrior named Kalasis, who is off to rescue Princess Reina from the mysterious demon whom the game is named after. If you want to get technical, that's only the brief version. The manual and in-game intro that plays if you wait on the title screen goes much more in depth, but really, how much more do you really need? That's beside the point, though, so let's get down to the important stuff. Obviously, being a Zelda 1 clone, you'll most likely expect the overhead view where you fight monsters to gain money, which you use to buy items from people hidden in caves, and all that stuff. But, Golvelius actually throws more than one wrench into the machinery that is your expectations. First of all, the game is a lot more linear. While each area of the world can be explored openly, you cannot progress to the next section until you kill the boss and find the crystal of the area you're currently on. Second, there are no secondary weapons. You are stuck with your sword for the entire game. You can get new equipment, but their effects are more passive, like getting a better sword to do more damage, a pendant that causes you to take less damage from enemies, a shield that causes you to not take damage from projectiles, or boots that allow you to walk on water, that sort of thing. Third, dungeons are handled completely differently than they were in Zelda. When you enter the lair of a boss, the game switches into either a side-scrolling platformer or vertical auto-scrolling segment, where you fight enemies on your way to the boss. All bosses are fought in a top-down view. And strangely, Kalasis suddenly can move diagonally during boss fights, even though he can't anywhere else in the game. Now, there is one issue with these boss levels, and that is that the screen will not scroll backwards. If you get trapped in a dead end or knocked off the back of the screen by an enemy, you will leave the dungeon and have to start it again from scratch. And of course, later dungeons exploit this with lots of dead-end paths, forcing you to memorize the layout. Now, these differences might seem like a big step down from the original Zelda, and they kind of are, but the game is still fun to play and worth your time, so let's take a look at some positives. One nice feature is that there are a few instances where, like in the original Metroid, you can go back to earlier areas with better equipment and find new items. For example, as you leave the first area of the map, you cross a river via bridge. Seems like nothing major, but do you remember those boots that I mentioned earlier that let you walk on water? Once you get those, come back to this river, and you can walk to the left or right and find some hidden items. Another nice touch befitting the more action-based pace of this game is that every monster you kill has money, and you don't even have to pick it up. When the monster is destroyed, the gold is immediately earned, which I really appreciate. It helps streamline the game, especially when you consider how much grinding you'll have to do to earn gold to buy important items. This might be a good time to explain how you get items in this game. Monsters never drop items, except for the rare health power-up. And you can't find items in dungeons, either. All your major items will be gained by purchasing them from these old ladies that you find in caves that appear when you do something specific on a certain screen. Almost every screen has one. Two items that you'll especially want will be life potions, which are like energy tanks from Metroid, and Bibles, which allow you to carry more money? Weird. Occasionally, though, these old ladies will be selling other things, such as the equipment I mentioned earlier. This is a good opportunity to talk about one of the more odd little bits of personality this game has. 
If you try to buy something without having enough money, these ladies get pissed. Imagine trying to sneakily get a life potion without enough money, only to be assailed by... IDIOT! SIMPLETON! THOU HAST NOT ENOUGH GOLD! LEAVE! Actually, everyone gets pissed off when you waste their time. There are other characters as well. Rio the Fairy gives you hints. Although, sometimes she doesn't, and other times she messes with your head and stuff. Oh, so the boss level's hidden under a blue rock somewhere around here, huh? Thanks, Rio. Well, I'll just go off and find that blue rock and WHAT THE BLEEP?! Rio, you did that on purpose! <clears throat> well, anyway... Winkle gives you your current password. That's right, password. No battery backup here. Although, to be fair, even though the password is a little on the long side, they at least were careful to make sure that there weren't any characters that looked similar to one another. Any gives you a small health restoration for a small amount of gold. Dina gives you a small amount of gold in exchange for some of your health. Don't try this at home. And then there's Randar. Yes, it's the Blue Lander from Guardian Legend. This character was pretty much Compile's mascot. Randar is the best of all. He will completely refill your health for a low flat fee of 150 gold. He also doesn't throw a temper tantrum if you say no like any does. Actually, any is really a ripoff and should only be used in emergencies. Seriously, rudest healer ever. Uh, look, Innie, if I give you enough money to completely refill my health bar, will you please stop being so rude to me? Oh, come on! What is your problem? I just gave you a ton of money and let you completely refill my health bar, and you're still giving me lip. See if I ever do business with you again, you... You... Um, yeah. That's exactly the word I was going to use. Thank you, chun -Li. I hate you, Innie. You're always hurting my feelings. I bet you're not even a real angel. Where's Randar? <clears throat> I'm okay. I'm okay. Of course, being in a Japanese 8-bit game with a substantial amount of text, you will find some English here and there. One of my favorites is when you go to one of the old ladies when you don't have enough gold to buy their item, and they tell you to go gold more. Now, at first glance, this doesn't make sense even from a mistranslation point of view. How do you get verbs and nouns so confused? Well, I'm pretty sure I have the answer. In the Japanese version of this game, the currency you used to buy items wasn't gold. It was called... Find. When the game was brought over to the West, Sega decided to change this to keep from confusing us stupid American kids. So, they changed find into gold, to fit the common European fantasy cliché. However, whoever translated the script for the English version didn't count on the word find also being an English verb, so they changed it to gold also. So the old woman is supposed to say, go find more, as in find some more money. There are other parts in this game's dialogue where the exact same mistake occurs, so I'm pretty sure that this is what happened. So, you grind to get the equipment you need to fight the boss. Then you go into the dungeon and do so. What then? Well, when you kill a boss, your health and gold are increased to their current maximum, and a new cave will open up somewhere in the area. When you find it, an old lady will be there to sell you one of the seven crystals you need before you can fight Golvelius. That's right, beating the boss isn't enough. You have to buy the crystal. Yeah, why couldn't they just give it to you when you beat the boss? Who knows? So anyway, after you get the crystal, what happens then? Well, you move on to the next area, which is typically larger, more dangerous, and has more expensive items, and do it again. Bye-bye. Hey, come back! It's a lot more fun than it sounds, okay? Thank you.
There are a lot of neat little things that help to give the game more character, like the fact that every boss has its own theme song that plays when you fight it, or how the overworld music changes at certain equipment milestones. Speaking of the music, in Japan, Sega released an add-on for the Mark III, the Japanese version of the Master System, which allowed it to play FM sound in certain games, Golvelius being one of them. Sadly, the FM sound module was never released outside of Japan. Even more bizarre, there are several games for the system that were Western exclusives that supported the FM module, in expectation of it making its way across the pond. Luckily, this story has a happy ending. Hardcore Master System fans have found a way to modify their consoles to support FM by soldering in a new circuit board to the sound hardware, allowing you to play these games with FM sound as they were meant to be heard. Stay tuned after the review for more information. In the meantime, here's a sound comparison. The game also has one of the coolest power-ups I've ever seen in an action-adventure game. The last pair of boots, which literally allow you to walk over almost anything. You can walk over water, trees, rocks, pretty much everything except the mountains. It feels like you turned on no clipping mode. It really is quite amazing to see mazes suddenly become trivial when you can walk over the walls without problem. It almost gives a feeling of godliness, where you have conquered not only the world, but its logic as well. Of course, you don't get them until near the end, but it's still amazing that Compile included them in the first place. Of course, finding the boots is one thing, and saving up enough to actually buy them is another problem altogether. There's a lot of points in Golvelius where it feels like all you're doing is saving up to buy new items. It's a major problem with the game's pacing. Now, at least in my experience, the grinding wasn't super terrible in this game. It's certainly not the worst I've seen in a game from this period, that's for sure. The enemies do seem to give a proportionate amount of gold compared to the prices of the items you're currently trying to buy. That's not a problem. You just need to find good, low-risk, high-gain screens to grind on. My biggest gripe with this game is what happens when you die. You not only lose half your gold, but you respawn at the very beginning of the overworld. You also appear here when you enter a password. This is extremely frustrating because you can't just start right back up and try again at whatever killed you. You have to hike back to the area you were in. Imagine being in the last section of the game, grinding for those flying boots that I mentioned earlier, getting killed, and then not only do you have to walk all the way back to the last area, but you also need to grind more than you would have. I understand wanting to give the player a slap on the wrist for dying, but this is ridiculous. Now, I just want to be clear that despite the fact that Golvelia suffers from all these issues, it's still a very fun game with a lot of charm, and if you can handle the problems I've mentioned, do give it a try. Now, there's one other thing I haven't mentioned yet that deserves to be talked about. There are actually three different versions of Golvelius, and only the second, the Master System version, was released in America. The first version and the third version were only released in Japan. The original version of Golvelius was released in 1987, one year before the Master System version, for a computer model that was never really popular in America called the MSX. Actually, a lot of third-party game developers released games for the MSX. Konami, in particular, released some games that were never released outside of that platform, including games in the Gradius and Castlevania franchises. They also released the first Metal Gear game on MSX.
Golvelius for the MSX plays a lot like the Master System version, only slightly more low-tech. It follows the same story and gameplay mechanics, but is still worth playing for fans because of the fact that it has completely different maps. It also has been translated into English by fans, so there is no excuse for hardcore Golvelius fans to pass up playing this. It's like playing the second quest in Zelda 1, although, to be accurate, we technically got the second quest while Japan got all three. Which brings us to the final version of Golvelius, the MSX2 version. The MSX2 version of Golvelius follows the same story and gameplay mechanics as the other two versions, but has some special features that set it apart. The first thing that hardcore fans might notice is that the opening cutscene, which I must say is quite beautiful by 1988 standards, tells a slightly different story than previous versions of the game. According to the Sega Master System version of the game, at least the English one, Calasis was just passing through the Kingdom of Allade when he heard about all the problems and decided to go rescue Princess Reina because, according to the manual, he saw a picture of her and fell in love with her instantly. In the MSX2 version, Calasis is found out in the wilderness, wounded and dying by Princess Reina, who brings him back to the Kingdom of Allade and begins nursing him back to hell. During this time, the demons attack, and during the battle, the king is wounded, forcing Princess Reina to lead the troops. She is then captured by Golvelius. It is then that Calasis decides to go out and rescue her and defeat the demons. Doesn't that make a lot more sense compared to the other versions? If Calasis was nursed back to health by Princess Reina, that means they probably spent some time together. And that would give Calasis much more of a reason to fall in love with her than just seeing a picture of her. It also gives him more motivation to go out and save her. I also like what they did with the king in this version. In other versions of the game, it just says that he got severely ill because he was so worried about his people suffering at the hands of the demons. Having him actually be wounded by the demons in a battle makes a lot more sense. It also adds more urgency to the plot. These demons are bad news and they're very tough and dangerous. So overall, I'd say the story in this version is just a lot better overall. One strange feature of this version is the fact that you have to name the hero and princess which is odd, given the fact that we just saw their names in the opening cutscene. The next major difference is how the game opens. You actually begin in a town. Yes, you actually get to see the Kingdom of Allade in-game. So you go around talking to people, gathering your starting items and stuff, and running a few errands for the townsfolk before you get to the game proper. It's interesting, but in my opinion, not really necessary. It actually kind of slows down the beginning of the game. But the best change, in my opinion, is the improvements they've made to the controls. In previous versions of the game, it felt like Calasis was locked down onto a grid, only able to change direction in between tiles on the world map. In this version, you have pixel-perfect precision of your control of Calasis. But best of all, now you can actually, at any time, move diagonally! So, yeah, this version's pretty good. Definitely give it a play if you want more Golvelius. My only real problem has to do with the English translation. It was done by a Spanish group who first translated the game into Spanish from the original Japanese, and then translated the Spanish version into English, and because of all this, the English used is a little bit iffy. Now, that's all three versions of Golvelius, but there's actually one other game that Compile made that's relevant, and that would be their parody game of Golvelius, Supercooks. 
It's basically to Golvelius what Parodius was to Gradius, and it's also worth looking into if you're a true fan. In this game, Kalasis is a chef doing chef things, I guess, because he's running around with a frying pan, braining uh, evil foods and other kitchenware utensils and stuff. I doubt I'm going to learn anything about real cooking from this game, but that's beside the point. There is one thing that really bothers me about this version, though, and that's... Well, look at Kalasis! His hair color is wrong! It's supposed to be green, not brown! Ugh, I don't know why they changed that. That's just... I don't know, I just it just feels weird. Now, as I'm recording this, I'm pretty sure that Supercooks has never been translated into English, so I have no idea what the actual plot is or what I'm supposed to be doing, because everything is in Japanese. My little sister might be able to help, she's learning Japanese, but, eh. Now, there's one last thing I need to address, and that is the ending of the game. You see, when you rescue Princess Reina and defeat Golvelius, you are treated to a nice long ending cinematic with good music, great visuals, a few nice story twists, and all seems to be sunshine and candy. But there's a problem, and I'm going to address it right here and now. The ending at the very end promises a sequel. A sequel which was never made. For 25 years, no more than that now, we've waited to see what adventures Kalasis would go on, and we were kind of robbed of that. I mean, we, they even went as far as to promise what kind of story threads would be addressed in this sequel that never came to be. So, it's, it's a really sad ending to an otherwise uplifting tale. But let's not lose hope. We still have three wonderful versions of this game to play, and it's still definitely worth your time. I highly recommend Golvelius to all fans of the original Legend of Zelda and similar games. And let's not forget, we never know what the future may hold. For all we know, Compile Heart may change their mind and decide, hey, let's make a sequel to this game. We never know what the future may hold. This concludes my review of Golvelius, but I believe I made a promise to some of you that I would tell you how to get FM sound on your Master System. Which leads me to my special segment of this show, Hardcore Gamer Shopping! In this segment, we discuss products that you can purchase through the internet that are by hardcore gamers for hardcore gamers. And all the products in this segment have been bought, tested, and approved by me, so that you, the viewer, don't get swindled. On today's edition, we are talking about the Sega Master System FM Sound Expansion Board by Vile Tim. Once installed into an American or European Master System, you can experience the FM sound of supported games without hassle. All you do is flip the switch, which is included, and you can experience the games with either the original PSG sound, which you're all familiar with, or with brand new, high quality, for the late 80s anyway, FM sound that until recently was only available on an actual console in Japan. All you do is plug the circuit board into the expansion slot here. Then you do a little soldering according to the online instructions, mount the switch, and you're ready to go. It even comes with a built-in region switch so that you can play those especially troublesome games that only play FM sound when detecting a Japanese system like Wonder Boy 3, The Dragon's Trap. Now, some models of the Master System like the Master System 2, don't have an expansion port. But, there is a special version of this expansion board, which is installed completely via soldering, meaning that even those models can have FM sound capabilities. If you have a Master System and want to be able to experience FM sound on it, I highly recommend buying an add-on board from Vile Tim at his website at www.etim.net.au. Besides the online shop, you can also access information on all the products Vile Tim has made, including information on the Sega Master System FM Expansion Board. Here you can get information on how to install it in different models of the Master System, 
history of the project, and much more. Please keep in mind, though, that not all Master System games have FM soundtracks, and some that do will only have them on Japanese copies of the game. There are some Western exclusives that have FM soundtracks, though, and those are only accessible on a system with this mod. Do not attempt this mod on a Japanese Master System known as a Mark III. Instead, buy an official FM Sound expansion module or a system with FM Sound built in. Neither Viletim nor myself are responsible for any issues you may have with your system after installing this mod. If you do have problems, though, be sure to contact the nice people at the SMS Power Forums for assistance. Well, that's all for this first episode of Games You Haven't Played, but stay tuned because more episodes are definitely on the way. If you have any questions or comments about this video, or if you just want to request a game for me to review, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email at rjack2 at yahoo.com. I'm Colin Pierce, this has been Game Show and Played, and until next time, I've got to figure out what Sega was thinking when they put the pause button on the system itself. I mean, what the hell?